Hello and welcome to UNA Forum Presents uh, 61st San Francisco International Film Festival. There are going to be a lot of filmmakers from all over the world, but in our studio we have three wonderful local filmmakers who are going to have film uh, in the festival. Uh, first, I would like to uh, present uh, Daniela Svega. She has a film, uh, Push Outs, and then we have uh, Zachary Fink who has a film, uh, the rescue list, and then we have Don Hardy with uh, um, Pick Up the Litter. So thank you so much for being with us in the studio. And just please uh, tell us a little bit about the film and also the film festival. Uh, Daniela, how your film, Push Outs, was selected for, the, for this film festival? What was the, where was the moment you learned about that? Um, the moment that we learned about uh, getting selected? It's like all those moments you get you get the the notice and you're very excited. It's a it's a great festival with um, a great selection of documentaries and and we're local, so we're very happy to be showing there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also present the story, which is local, uh, but uh, um, it's much more than that. Uh, the, the idea of having uh, push outs and uh, um, tell us a little bit about that. What does it yeah. mean actually? Yeah. Push out. Well, our film, The Push Outs, is it, it, it's really about youth, uh, the millions of youth who, um, who most people through the in the United States refer to as dropouts, and um, but as we explore in our film, are really pushed out of the educational system through uh, no fault of their own. Um, we explore we explore the subject primarily through our main character. Dr. Victor Rios, who by 15 was a, um, had three felony convictions. He was a gang member, um, drug dealer, and in and out of school and homelessness. And by age 38, he, um, he was a tenured professor at UC and writer, author, um, and thought leader on the school to prison pipeline and um, uh, criminalization of youth of color. Um, so we explore the subject through uh, through his life story, and um, and and we tell it in a, a series of ways. We um, what we didn't know when we uh, when we started exploring this story was that there was a, a treasure trove of archival footage mm -hmm. that um, of of. Victor Rios and one of his key mentors, someone who he credits with uh, being one of those people that that really helped him during this turbulent time and make a make a real shift. So um, we uh, so we we tell the story through both contemporary footage of um, mm -hmm. a project that he runs in Watts, California, over the, the course of six weeks with forty push out youth who. Um, whose stories all reflect aspects of his own, and we also tell it through his uh, through going back and forth in time with his own life story. Wonderful. So let's see the clip uh, from the documentary, The Push Outs. When I was this little, I told myself, man, school is not for me. Why do I want to go to school if it's not helping my mom pay the bills? I remember going hungry. And I remember seeing my mom cry because she couldn't feed her kids. And I tell myself, man, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be poor. Victor, once you go in, 
you have to be willing to die. That's what one of the OGs would always tell me. Guys, go away. Hey, today's a good day to die. I realized that there's a lot of kids. They have potential, but it has not come to the forefront. Potential to do what? <laughs> potential to graduate, <laughs> potential for further education, most of them. I just finished reading our next speaker's book, Punished, Policing the Lives of Black and Latino Boys. Ladies and gentlemen, award-winning professor Victor Rios. There's a survivor's guilt that I live with for having left my neighborhood and my family in Oakland. And the way I make up for it is to be there for the people, like the people I left behind. My mom had an accident and she couldn't work anymore. So me as the oldest one, I had, I had to start working. It's either this or that. So I choose to work because I need the money. <laughs> My dad, he got shot. And I think that's the reason why I messed up my grade so much, because I couldn't do nothing but just stress over it. They kicked me out of school because, you know, my grades was too low. I have a few friends that are locked up, you know, and like, I see them, how they suffer, like, how they struggle. I don't want that for me. We just saw the clip uh, from the documentary, The Push Outs. Uh, uh, Daniela, could you please tell us a little bit about the archive footage that you mentioned? Because that's always a very expensive part for the filmmaker, but also very challenging because you have to go through many, many uh, views and edits. So tell us a little bit about that part of the film. Yeah, um, well, that was, uh, that was one of the most exciting um, reveals for us. Uh, we when um, Katie Galloway, the director, uh, first contacted Victor Rios, he, um, they, they had a discussion about, uh, about this project that he would be doing in Watts, and he mentioned that he had been filmed um, when he was 15 in, in 1994 um, as part of a documentary, a frontline documentary, uh, um, A Year in the Life of Berkeley High. And um, there was just, he was, he ultimately, he was one of about 20 students who were followed during this time. Uh, so we knew that he was filmed, but we didn't know to what extent. And ultimate, in the ultimate film, he was just in it for a, that fight scene that you, you see. So, um, and it was something that was disappointing to him because he had already started to um, change his life when that film aired and it presented him in this um, in this particular place that he was ready to leave behind. So uh, we teamed up with our, our executive producer, Sharon Tiller, who had been the producer of that frontline mm -hmm. film and um, through Center for Investigative Reporting had all the tapes. And so I sat there in a very tiny mm -hmm. edit suite looking and logging through um, uh, hours and hours of this footage, and um, and it was incredibly moving for me, uh, in particular because, as you can see from that clip, Victor Rios now as a uh, as a man in his 40s and accomplished is very confident and um, and seems like he's always been in that place, and there was the 15 year old Victor talking about the exact same things that are the core of his life's work at 15 that were upsetting to him, having no idea that he would be anywhere uh, that he is now in life. And, um, and so to, to me and to, to the filmmakers, it really, spoke to, um, it really spoke to the fact that when you look at any teenager, you really don't know uh, what they have the potential to become. Mm -hmm. um, 15-year-old Victor was insecure. He was 
uh, shy, he, he, and, and so on. So. And which is wonderful uh, connection with another part of the world, uh, which is Ghana, that we have a documentary, The Rescue List, and Zachary did uh, also this inspirational story, what you are all doing in, uh, uh, from the other part of the world. So, uh, Zachary, tell us a little bit about the motivation and to save these kids who are working in the fields and working in the, in the lake in Ghana who wanted to be something else, not just the children. Yeah, well, um, so the, the rescue list is the story of uh, a couple of boys who've been rescued from slavery to fishermen, um, specifically on a lake in Ghana called Lake Volta. And it follows them over the course of a year long period after they've been rescued in a rehabilitation shelter as they're going through rehabilitation and preparing to be reunited with their families. And along the course of uh, that rehabilitation process, the the lead rescuer comes back to the shelter to speak with the children. And one of our main characters, uh, one of the, our, the boys that we've been following, asks the rescuer to go back to the lake on his next rescue mission, specifically to find his best friend. And so the film kind of follows the trajectory of that rescue and the friendship and the bonds um, that these boys have made as they come back together in the shelter and ev eventually are pulled apart once more uh, when they go back to their families. Um, but it is interesting, there is a lot of connection there because the part of the, the rescue um, is often a negotiation uh, between the rescuer and the slave masters who have these kids on the lake. Mm -hmm. And part of uh, the tactics that Kwame, the lead rescuer, uses in those negotiations is talking about uh, the potential that these children may have in the future and, and kind of mm -hmm. what, um, you know, what they can become because uh, the, the founder of the organization, uh, his name is James Kofi Annan. Uh, he himself was enslaved as a child and escaped when he was 13. Mm -hmm. And over the course of, uh, you know, 20 years, kind of put himself through school, got a job, and then at some point in his late 30s realized that what he needed to be doing was helping these kids on the lake. Mm -hmm. So. Wonderful. So let's see that clip from the film, uh, The Rescue List. Okay. <laughs> Hmm? Me I can't so we just saw that clip from the film, The Rescue List, uh, which is going to be presenting at the 61st San Francisco International Film Festival. Uh, Zachary, uh, how did you connect with this story? Well, I actually met uh, James Kofi Annan, the founder of this uh, uh, rescue organization that's based in Ghana at a mm -hmm. fundraiser here in California. He uh, kind of travels around the world uh, raising money for his organization, Challenging Heights, um, and I made the connection with him there initially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talking about another rescue, um, uh, we are now focusing uh, on the animals. And in uh, Don Hardy's film, uh, Pick Up a Litter, is something that we see but don't understand uh, very often. And this is actually how humanity is connected with animals, particularly dogs. So uh, Don, tell us a little bit about uh, the way how you put together the story with the animals and obviously all of us who are trying to find the solution for the blind people. 
Yeah, the, uh, we see service dogs often out walking the streets, and, and many times we don't know how to interact with them. So uh, my filmmaking partner Dana and I uh, thought it would be interesting to try to tell that story. And so we uh, contacted a few different organizations to see if anybody would allow us the access to come in and do it. And, and we found a great one in San Rafael, California called Guide Dogs for the Blind. And they let us come in and see behind the scenes and follow one litter of puppies from their birth all the way through the process to see if they have what it takes to make it to become a guide dog for the blind. And not every dog is cut out for it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was just a really interesting journey to take. And we had a movie with five lead stars and their dogs and they're totally unpredictable. And you just have to come up with an interesting way to try to film it and accept what you don't know and okay, <laughs> take so the ride. So let's see the clip from the documentary, uh, pick up a litter. You're a little bit of a celebrity already. These dogs have to be trained to take care of someone's life. They have to do everything correctly 100% of the time. They can't just walk their person into traffic once. I keep hearing that every day is an adventure with your dog, and I really look forward to that because I love the whole idea of exploration and going places I've never been before. There's only so much that I can do at this point. Becoming a die dog is one of the most difficult challenges for any dog. And the ones that do make it are, are truly the cream of the crop. <laughs> did not meet our expectations to move on to the next step. Forward. Oh. Woo! <laughs> I have butterflies the size of foxes. I'm so nervous. It's I'm kind of a kid, you know, it's that nervous expectation. And... Ron, I have a present for you. We saw the clip uh, from the documentary, Pick Up a Litter. Uh, so Don, the challenge is for the camera, uh, working with the dogs, uh, and, and, and how did you actually, how do you direct them? Yeah, it, it, it was definitely challenging. It was a lot easier when they were these little mounds that didn't move very much, mm -hmm. but once they got into the real training, they, they train the dogs incredibly fast, because ultimately they are mobility devices. They're there to help somebody get from point A to point B, so they, they walk fast. And so me keeping up with a big camera on my shoulder wasn't going to work. So we devised this little setup with basically a little steady cam to be able to keep up. It would allow me to go up really high with it and down really low and in and out of cars and uh, not in traffic too much. I only ran into about five parking meters uh, along my journey. But, uh, but it gave us that feeling that you could really, uh, we tried to be in the dog's eye view as much as possible with it and uh, take the journey with them. Mm -hmm. So this is a question for all of you. Uh, uh, working with the, uh, the films, you want to actually to connect with the community organizations and obviously try to uh, spread the word that the film is living not only in the film festivals, but actually really be useful for the community to connect with the stories and to have the life forever. 
So um, I'm just going to start here from down and uh, how you're going to do this outreach, where exactly you're going to take your film after the film festival. Yeah, we, well, we're very fortunate. There are a lot of organizations, service dog organizations out there that have already embraced the film. Uh, we've screened it a few times and the, the response has been great. So people are coming out uh, with their dogs and we're also working with a, uh, a, a startup app manufacturer uh -huh. who has, um, gives descriptive audio. So it's going to be accessible to those visually impaired mm -hmm. and so they can come to see the movie in the theater too and experience it with others. And uh, doing all of that, a lot of festivals on the horizon for the film, and then it goes into distribution. Um, Do in you the have summer. already the, the plan yeah, for the we're, distribution? Uh, Sundance Selects picked us up, so uh -huh. we're going to go into theaters in uh, probably late August. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Zach, how about the plans for? Yeah, so The Rescue List is just getting started. We're about to have our world premiere at the uh, San Francisco International Film Festival this coming Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and they have graciously partner, helped us partner with uh, Human Rights Watch, who will be um, kind of a collaborating partner on our second screening uh, next week, which is the 11th. And there's going to be an extended question and answer after the film. Uh, with a couple of experts in human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And we are kind of in the beginning stages of uh, dialogue with a couple of other human rights organizations right now as we kind of uh, look to the future of community screenings and educational outreach for this film. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, and yeah. We're, the Push Outs is in a similar position. We, um, we premiere at Full Frame Festival on the 7th um, and, uh, and then come to San Francisco on the 10th. Uh, at 6 p.m. and um, we uh, we will be airing on PBS sometime mm -hmm. in the fall, and um, so and the distribution plan. I mean, for the still national, st international, uh, national. Yes, mm -hmm. we're still working out the details of that. And we have um, through Sundance School, we partnered with Youth Build. So they will be doing, also helping partner with a lot of community screenings, and we hope to get it into schools and into, um, you know, to have students, administrators, teachers, and um, hopefully eventually policymakers mm -hmm. um, engage with it. But that's all currently in development. So that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about the educational distribution, because it, having uh, films, all three films in the schools and having actually teachers using them for the uh, different groups of children, I think it's very, very important. So any ideas about educational distribution or? Well, through San Francisco uh, Film Festival, we're actually doing a screening the following day at, on the 11th for um, people at Berkeley High where a lot of this archival mm -hmm. took place. Um, and beyond that, we don't know. But you know that is that it will be um, hopefully some kind of model for how we take it mm -hmm. um, in the future. So any guests, I mean, that we can expect that they're going to be at the screenings? Yeah, for, for our film, our main uh, character, Victor Rios, is going to be there. Martin Flores, who was his main mentor. Uh, Flora Russ, who was um, one of his, his was his, his teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the various mentors who, uh, who worked on the project are coming. We have Love Jefferson and uh, Kadir Raja and, and various other, uh, other people. We're, um, we're, we're looking to other screenings with the youth um, and s not quite sure if they're going to make it to the San Francisco one or not. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, James Kofi Annan, the uh, founder of the Rescue Organization, whose work and whose life story kind of inspired this film, uh, will be at uh, the first San Francisco screening. Um, but unfortunately, the kind of main characters of the film who we tried to get uh, visas for were unable to get their visas because of the current political situation. So uh, they won't be in attendance, but uh, we'll be there in spirit, and we're looking mm -hmm. forward to bringing the film to them yeah, uh, so sometime in the very near future. So that's what I was wondering. So are there any plans for screening Ghana? E yes, we're, we're working that out now. There's a Ghanaian Film Festival this summer that we're hoping to screen at, um, but also we plan to take the film directly to the shelter, to the current 50 or 60 children who are 
in the shelter where we worked, mm -hmm. and then also into the community. All the all the children that were that are in our film have now gone home to their families uh, because they stay at the shelter for about a year, and we're we're past that mark now. Uh, so we'll have a um, kind of a, a screening in one of the communities, and we will work with the organization to kind of round up the children and their families um, who were in the shelter while we were filming to come and experience the film. We're That's really great. looking forward to That's that. Great. That's really wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Enda? Yeah, we, we have a screening Saturday morning, uh, this Saturday at 11.30 at the Victoria Theater, mm -hmm. and it's open to the public, uh, free to the public, I should say, and uh, it's going to be full of guide dogs and regular dogs uh -huh. and their companions, and it should be uh, quite something. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. So, in just a little kind of last uh, moment of using a social media, can just give us a little bit of guidance for that, uh, any Facebook or... Yeah, for us it's just pickofthelittermovie.com and that has everything on it. Mm -hmm. Yep, and okay. we're at therescuelist.com and we're also at Facebook forward slash therescuelist. Mm -hmm. Thepushouts.com. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah, on uh, one thing, because you said in both of your cases, in Don and uh, then uh, the, the, there's going to be a free screening community. What does it mean, free community screening? So. Uh, is that something, this is the part of the festival which is really fantastic, but you said before this program that it's sold out. So yeah. what, what does it mean? A free booked. Screening? So, yeah. It's like booked. A, well, sold, out, sold out means booked. Uh, yeah, I think right. they, they, um, for, for, um, they wanted to make it open and accessible to the people whom it could potentially affect most. That was, um, that was the, part of the reason why they wanted to do it as a community screening for us, but you still had to book your tickets. And at this point, there still are tickets at Rush, but mm -hmm. um, but you have to get there. <laughs> yeah. well, Rush means you just have to get there and get in line. And generally, most of the Rush line gets in, so certainly encourage everybody to come out if they want to see the movie. The, oh. It's a large theater. It's a, You were saying it was... I think it's around 500 so, seats. Yeah, tell yeah. us exactly where the place is for all of your films. So the, the, this is... The Victoria Theater for me. Okay, so... And the same for... Us. Yep, and we're at the Dolby Theater um, on the 6th and on the 11th, and on the 12th, um, I should say the 6th and the 11th are also both at Rush right now, and uh, the 12th is at the Children's Creativity Museum at 3.30, and there are still tickets available for that. Okay, and what's the last moment, uh, because what we see uh, behind us, obviously there are posters for the push-outs, and uh, we do have also posters for the rescue list. Don, when is going to be a poster for your film? So we have a this poster. Is, this is something... It's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so because these are the posters from uh, also from other films uh, uh, for the 61st San Francisco International Film Festival. We are going to see a lot of films behind me. There's also a documentary about Robin Williams uh, by Marina Z uh, uh, she's actually one of the filmmakers who is go she's going to be also at the festival. Uh, but uh, um, I'm suggesting definitely the posters are always useful thing. You can see the posters in the, in the Facebook and then maybe you can order some of the posters. Thank you so much for being in our studio and uh, good luck with your documentaries and we'll see you in the movie theaters also. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. Thanks for having us.